Hello everybody, welcome back to the channel. I'm here with an A-level chemistry question walkthrough about bonding. In this video I'll be showing my thoughts behind the question in blue and the answers that are going to get you the marks will be in green. If you want to just watch me work through the question then that's obviously great, but if you want to have a go at the questions yourself first then download them as a PDF from the description. We're going to look at three different questions in this video, ranging through the different types of bonding. This first question asks us about crystal structures and the bonding shown by different elements and compounds. And it starts by asking us to name the type of bonding shown by the element sodium. Now, when you're answering a question like this, you need to think, what type of substance is this element or compound that they're asking me about? and sodium is in group one, the alkali metals, so it is a metal, and in fact all you need to write for the type of bonding is metallic. And then it says use the knowledge that you have of structure and bonding to draw a diagram showing how the particles are arranged in a crystal of sodium, identifying the particles showing a minimum of six in two dimensions. So now we've unpicked that it is metallic, we are showing the metallic bonding. And metallic bonding is when you have got a regular lattice of metal ions, and we've been told to draw six minimum, so I suggest you draw six. You won't get any more marks for drawing more. So draw a grid of two layers of three would be my advice. But if you want to draw more, then obviously fine, but I wouldn't worry too much. And certainly don't worry about trying to show perspective. In the center of the ion, you can write a plus to show that it is a positive ion, or you could write Na+. It is absolutely fine either way. In this question, there's no mark for showing the delocalized electrons that move between the ions and move through the structure, but you can put them in and it will just be ignored. You certainly won't get penalized for them. So one mark for showing the nice regular arrangement of sodium ions in the lattice, and the second mark is for indicating that you know that they are positively charged. And then in this second part of the question, we are told that sodium reacts with chlorine to form sodium chloride, and we're asked to name the type of bonding in sodium chloride. And so the thought process needs to be, okay, sodium is a group one metal, chlorine becomes chloride, but chlorine is a non-metal, and so metal and non-metal is ionic bonding. The follow-up to that says, explain why the melting point of sodium chloride is high. And so this is tricky because they haven't told us the type of bonding, but now we've worked out that it is ionic, we're effectively just describing ionic bonding. We don't need to personalise it to sodium chloride. And so in ionic bonding, we need to talk about the strong electrostatic attraction between oppositely charged ions or particles. And I've drawn a lattice just to the right hand side just so we can appreciate it. It's in blue because we won't get any extra marks for it. But you can see the positive and the negative ions oppositely charged. They're going to attract each, each other in three dimensions. So that means that this central positive ion will have four negative ions in the same plane as it. And it will have one coming out towards us and one going into the page as well. So we'll have six ions surrounding each individual ion. So lots of very strong electrostatic attractions in this lattice. And then the final part of this question asks us to suggest why the melting point of sodium iodide, that's this one, is much lower than the melting point of sodium bromide. It's by 100 Kelvin lower melting point. And so since both of those compounds, we, we haven't been asked about sodium chloride, so we can forget about that. We've just been asked about sodium bromide and sodium iodide. And so in both of those chemicals, they've both got the sodium ion. So it's not to do with the sodium ion, and it can therefore only be to do with the bromide ion compared to the iodide ion. And the bromide ion is slightly higher up in the periodic table. It's at one higher period than the iodide ion. And so that means that the iodide ion is bigger. And that's all you need to say, because we've only got one mark here, so it's bigger. We do need that comparative reference, though. It's not just OK to say the iodide ion is large. It needs to be bigger than the bromide. 
As a result of that, just for your extra understanding, it means that the charge density of the iodide is going to be lower, and that means it will therefore have a weaker electrostatic attraction for all the sodium ions that surround it. But the iodide ion is bigger, is all we need to say. In this second question, we've been given a table of data and this time we're being shown electronegativity data from lithium through to fluorine. So that is across period two. We've been asked in the first part of the question to explain the meaning of the term electronegativity. And we've got two marks and it's that second mark that people often miss out. So electronegativity is defined as the power of an atom to withdraw electrons from a covalent bond or in a covalent bond. And it's that covalent bond that's the crucial second mark. So we could say atom, we could say nucleus, we could say withdraw, or we could say attract. It doesn't really matter precise wording for that. It's the covalent bond that is essential. And then the question moves on to ask why the elements increase in electronegativity from lithium to fluorine. So you need to think about how do those elements change as we go from lithium all the way across to fluorine. Now I said earlier that they are in period two and they are all in period two. And so what that means is that each atom has the same shielding or similar shielding in terms of the subshells, but the same shielding close enough. And certainly the electrons are therefore in the same energy level, but what also happens is the atom gets smaller as you move across the period from lithium to fluorine. And so any one of those three first points gets us mark number one, and then we follow up by saying that as we go across the period, the atoms get more protons in their nucleus or a bigger nuclear charge. That's the second mark. The question moves on to ask us about the type of bonding in lithium fluoride next, and they give us a clue that this is a strong type of bonding because they say explain why a lot of energy is needed to melt a sample of lithium fluoride. So that's partly a clue, but just like in question one, we have to think, okay, lithium is a metal, fluorine makes the fluoride, and fluorine is in group seven, so it is a non-metal, which means the type of bonding is ionic. Then the explanation, well, it says a lot of energy is needed to melt the solid lithium fluoride. So we need to say that there must be strong attractions between the particles, or we know it's ionic, so it's strong electrostatic attractions between the ions. And we need to also communicate our knowledge that we know that lithium will be positive and fluoride will be negative, or we could just be very general and say between positive and negative ions. And then the final part of this question says, deduce why the bonding in nitrogen oxide is covalent rather than ionic. And that's where we have to look at the electronegativity that we've been given. We've not actually used that data yet, really. So nitrogen is up here with an electronegativity of three, and oxygen has got an electronegativity of 3.5. Now we don't need to memorize these data, but what we do need to appreciate is that three and 3.5 are really similar. The difference is only 0 0.5. So in terms of comparing them to each other, they are very similar. And so that's all that we need to say for this mark. It's covalent because the electronegativity difference is very small, or they have similar electronegativities. They could just as easily have asked us to justify why lithium fluoride is ionic, and that's because lithium has a really low electronegativity of one, and fluorine has the highest electronegativity there is on this scale, which is four. So that's an electronegativity difference of three. And the rule of thumb is that the bigger the electronegativity difference, the more the ionic character will be for a particular compound. And so if the electronegativity is the same for something like N2, then they're both three, so it's going to be a covalent molecule. Oxygen, O2, same electronegativity, so again, a simple molecule. But when the difference is big, it will be ionic. This final question is quite a short one. We are shown a picture of ammonia reacting with boron trichloride to form a molecule with the structure shown. Then we've been asked, how does this bond between the ammonia and the boron trichloride form? So that's the bond here that's being shown with an arrow rather than a stick. 
And that is the clue that this is a dative covalent bond. But we actually haven't been asked for that information. We've just been asked, how does this bond form? And the answer is both the electrons in the covalent bond come from the nitrogen atom. And I do encourage you to personalise it by saying which atom they come from, rather than just saying both the electrons come from the same atom. Sometimes that's OK, sometimes it's not. But both come from the nitrogen atom. And then we are given a similar table to before. This time we're being asked to use these electronegativity values to suggest the formula of an ionic compound formed by the chemical combination of two different elements from the table. And so when you're choosing the ionic compound, as with the previous question, we're looking for a big electronegativity difference. Well, the safest bet really is lithium with fluorine because that's got the biggest electronegativity difference. So I would say that. We could also say lithium oxide. We could really say for A level, you could say really lithium hydride as well, because that's quite a difference, but it's not massive. So then we have to know what the formulae are for these, because we've been asked to give the formula of a particular ionic compound. So lithium would form a one plus ion and fluoride would form a one minus ion. So that's why I would lead with that one because that's just going to be LiF. Obviously, it's not too much tr more tricky to go with the oxide because O is two minus and so lithium oxide would be Li2O. Lithium hydride, when lithium or when any metal joins with hydrogen, because hydrogen is going to be more electronegative than the lithium, hydrogen actually forms the one minus hydride ion. And so that's something that we don't encounter often with hydrogen, but it can gain electrons if it's significantly more electronegative than the element that it's with. In other words, if it's bonded to a metal. And so LiH would be the formula of lithium hydride. Any of those, absolutely fine for our one mark. And then last of all, suggest the formula of the compound that has got the least polar bond and is formed by the combination of two elements in the table. Well, this time we're looking for elements that have got the closest electronegativity values. And this time we've got boron and hydrogen. Their electronegativity difference is only 0 0.1. And so we need to be making a compound that contains boron and hydrogen. Now boron is in group three, which means it's got three electrons in its outer energy level. Hydrogen is of course in group one, which means it's got one electron in its outer energy level. So in terms of simple electron sharing dot and cross diagram, it would look like this. It would be the trigonal planar arrangement of hydrogen atoms around the boron being a flat structure. And so the formula would simply be BH3. And this is how you could have worked it out if you couldn't do it from memory. OK, that was the final question. That's the end of this video. Hope it was useful. I'll see you again soon.